When were you making fun of me about not knowing about Mick and Morty? Uh, it, first of all, it's Rick and Morty. Second of all, that definitely wasn't me because I don't know anything about it either. I've never seen it. Um, but I, but I I'm that, constantly did, making fun of you. Wait, hold on. Wait, hold on a second. You're telling me that this did not just come up in Duluth. You weren't making fun of me about this. No, Mm-mm. no. I like I'm I'm sort of uh, aware that Rick and Morty exists from Twitter, and I I and I know it's an animated series, and that's all I know about it. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh no, my no. god! I know what you're thinking. Of. <laughs> You're thinking of Mork and Mindy. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is a completely <laughs> different thing. <laughs> right. You were making fun of me about that, though, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I don't know how you <laughs> came to be an adult in America and never heard of Mork and Mindy before. I mean, that's completely uh, insane. I, still, I was still messing it up. Did you say you grew up without television? Kind of. I mean, you know, it was very, very, I definitely grew up without cable and I I was on like heavy TV restriction all growing up. So I couldn't watch very much more than like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers and 321 Contact. And even then, Um, not too much of that, but yeah. (laughs) yeah. So wait, what's the name of the, I don't want to embarrass myself again. Mork and Mindy, uh, starring... Robin Williams. Have you heard of that guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Rick and Morty is uh, an animated series that apparently has an incredibly annoying fan base, uh, although I'm not I'm not exactly sure why. Um, so I should look into Mork. Absolutely. Yeah. I other- mean, it was one of the weirdest shows ever. Like uh, he aged backwards. He would like one of the running gags is that he would drink orange juice with his finger. Like, I, I, like he had a mouth and it presumably like <laughs> ate food and stuff through his mouth, but he would drink through his finger. I think it was just they figured out how to do like a camera trick and they thought it was hilarious. Um, yeah, I can't believe that you confused Mork and Mindy and Rick and Morty. <laughs> That's <laughs> well, amazing. How how can you not believe that if I don't really know either of them? Well, no, no, I mean, I believe it. I just like, I don't believe that a human being could do that. Like, I, it just, it's just funny, <laughs> like, you know. I haven't you're, seen either You're of more them. or less Amish. <laughs> like, you're, you know, well, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Welcome to Zero Sum Empire, the podcast that's taking a critical census of the 540 mostly anonymous American billionaires. I'm Chad. Uh, I'm Joe. Well, yeah, we haven't really been introducing ourselves because there are very few people who listen to the show who don't already know who we are. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll start to do that as a you know a, a discipline. Um. What is this, episode eight? Episode eight, yeah. Uh, We're closing in on the big double digits pretty soon. Today we're going to be talking about a bunch of different billionaires, actually. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Pritzker family. We'll get to that later in the show. Chad, who are you talking about? Uh, Tom Benson, owner of the New Orleans Saints. Uh, He actually is recently deceased. So uh, disclaimer, we're using a list that's a year old uh, of billionaires and he died uh, within the last year. So he's one of he's one of the few dead billionaires that's going to show up. Okay, so shall we uh, move on to billionaires in the news? Yeah, absolutely. Billionaires in the news. So today uh, we're talking about uh, Mackenzie Bezos. Do you think she's going to stay Bezos? Um, I don't know. If I, I were her, I would not. Well, that's my. Okay. Well, I think she will actually because uh, she's published two novels. She's a novelist, in case you didn't know that. I didn't uh, know that. And she published them under the name. Mackenzie Bezos, I believe. So I think once you, you know, once you've published a couple of novels, you don't want to change your, your name. Yeah, I get it. But I would just be, I would be too proud at that point, you know? Yeah. I don't think she's that proud. Uh, I mean, she's a novelist who's publishing books uh, and she's married to the guy who is famous for selling the most books. <laughs> like, you know, so like there might be some nepotistic connections uh, between her and her, her uh, publishers. Yeah. 
Um, Didn't even occur to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, she she did study with Toni Morrison, and and uh, in, in my research, I, I found that uh, Toni Morrison had nothing but good things to say about her. Um, okay. Um, well, let's not make fun of her then. Well, because I'm not willing to, uh, you know, get in the way of that. Well, I mean, you know, she may have been a, a different person when she was uh, a young college undergraduate uh, at Princeton. Uh, she comes from a, a relatively privileged background. Uh, you know, like I, I, don't, I guess we're not doing her biography uh, because she will, nah, she will come up in the list at some point. She's going right? to come up again. I guess yeah. the only, the only sort of funny fact that I'll mention is. Uh, uh, she did, uh, she, she always wanted to be a novelist and she went to, uh, you know, like a fancy prep school and then went to Princeton and, uh, graduated and moved to New York intent on being a novelist, uh, and, uh, and then found that it was difficult. So uh, almost immediately went to work at a hedge fund, which is where she met <laughs> okay. Bezos. Um, so I guess that's sort of just something that people do. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So the the reason she's in the news is because she got divorced uh, from uh, Bezos, and uh, that was a well. The reason that she's in the news is that she's giving away half of all of her billions. Right. Yeah. She signed the giving pledge, which Bezos famously decided not to sign. Although, um, and so this is something that Bill Gates came up with, or Bill and Melinda came uh, up with. Yeah, and uh, in conjunction with uh, Warren Buffett, uh, it's. <laughs> It, it's abs- it's it's not real. It's completely meaningless in the sense that like the giving pledge is just people publicly announcing that they're going to give away half of their assets uh, to charitable organizations uh, upon their death. Uh, the funny thing about that uh, that it is that the the estate tax, at least in the United States, uh, for all of these people will is forty percent. Uh, and so, uh, uh, they're already, um, uh, giving, you know, like if they were to do nothing, uh, 40% of their assets would be allocated to, uh, the IRS, you know, anyway. Oh, that's right? interesting. And so like one of the things that people criticize the giving pledge for, uh, is that it, it creates an opportunity for billionaires to do something, uh, uh, that that I think both of us would uh, uh, also be really critical of, which is that uh, they could give away their money prior to death or uh, write into their will uh, that uh, portions of their money need to be given to charity, uh, and that would allow them to duck the state the estate tax, right? And so that that forty percent uh, tax burden. That would be uh, levied against their inheritance uh, is something that they could uh, sort of escape. I just want to get this straight. So if I'm a billionaire and I sign the giving pledge and I give away half of my all of my riches upon my passing. Yes. Then I'm still giving away the rest of my riches, presumably to my family uh, or whoever else. Right. But that would also be subject to the estate tax, correct? Yes. Right. So, so you're not really escaping it. You're I mean, no, but a large portion, some of it. right? Like a large portion of your finances uh, or, or a, a large portion of your uh, money is escaping that estate tax. And so the problem with that is that the government is going to distribute that wealth in a very different way than the billionaires are going to distribute it. So uh, if you're Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, it seems like they have relatively good track records in terms of how they're choosing to distribute their funds charitably. Uh, I, you know, I don't keep up with it uh, in any sort of, you know, fine grained detail, but like, you know, they have relatively good reputations as far as I can tell. But what a lot of people do is that you can just put in your will that you want the money to go into a charitable trust, uh, like the Clinton Foundation or the Trump Foundation, right, <laughs> or something like this, and then that gets managed by the family. Uh, and uh, you know what people's salaries are is you know sort of questionable. There are a whole bunch of ways that people have pointed out that I you see. can abuse this system. And I see. you know, and, and so like this is not to say that people signing the Giving Pledge or Mackenzie Bezos or anybody is gonna is is going to do this some people are clearly going to do it and they're just sort of using the you know free publicity of signing the giving pledge to their advantage um uh but like what the the larger problem is not that people are going to use a uh, like a fake foundation to escape charitable giving and tax burdens the real problem is that in giving to charitable organizations prior 
uh, to le- the levying of the estate tax. It basically just says, okay, uh, billionaires, you get to decide what happens with this money instead of uh, the government deciding what happens to this right. money. Which is what we were talking about a little bit last right. episode. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, billionaires are predisposed to give to the arts and academ- academic interests, right? Like starting a business school or, uh, uh, you know, giving to the opera or something like this. And and while those might be worthy causes, right, there are things that tend to benefit uh, people who are already wealthy. Was that last statement that you made like rooted in some sort of data or evidence ab- about billionaires giving to things that tend to benefit billionaires or is it just sort of observational sort of? Uh, It's mainly observational, but it's not a criticism that I sort of invented out of whole cloth. There are some organizations that track charitable giving and stuff like this. And and, uh, uh, they they've pointed out, right, that uh, there's no sort of programmatic uh, way that billionaires can individually attack and solve problems. Right. Like they're just giving to things like like Summer Redstone. Right. Like who gives gives money to a hospital that just so happened to treat him for horrible burns. Right. Like that. uh, Right. Uh, right. Know. So um, so it's sort of the giving pledge sort of institutionalizes and, and grows that trend uh, a lot more. Um, and the weird thing is, I, I, you know, I also read that like Gates and Buffett are two big, big proponents of the estate tax. Right. Like they're often talking about how we need the estate tax. We should raise the estate tax. We should make sure that people can't escape the estate tax. Um but the giving pledge doesn't seem to jibe with that, you know, sort of a, a opinion that they have about the estate tax, uh, because it makes it easier for people to do other things besides pay it. Um, mm-hmm. So, hmm. okay. So, final final words about um, Mackenzie Mackenzie Bezos. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's up there in terms of richest people in the world. She's the third richest woman. You know, she's in the top fifty. Uh, it's it's a big big fortune, um, and uh, it's it's kind of interesting that you know uh, to see what she does with it. She, I mean, she I, maybe she'll donate to the show down the line. Maybe, yeah, yeah, that would be great. Um, I'll write her. A, I'll, I'll shoot her an email. And see, uh, see where we're at. One of the one of the things that's been a little bit unusual about the show to me is how many sports owners we've had so far. And I think that we've kind of yeah. teased that we were going to talk about sports infrastructure a little bit uh, in the past. I think this is this is the one to do it on, uh, because, first of all, the guy that I'm talking about is uh, is not particularly interesting outside of his sports ownership at all. He was a uh, it's a, 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 a Tom Benson. He got wealthy with car dealerships uh, and bought the Saints for seventy million dollars in 1985. Uh, today, they're around valued around two billion dollars. Uh, he's the richest. He was the richest man in Louisiana till he died this year. Uh, his wife has taken over uh, the business, and um, and so what I thought I the way I thought I would start is to say a little bit about uh, the economics of stadiums uh, because there are this has got to be a classic public private partnership type deal. Yeah, um, it's a it's a little it's a little bit strange. Um, I, I would say that stadium reno- renovations and new stadiums are almost always. Uh, public private partnerships, right? Like, so the team owners are definitely putting in some money uh, along with uh, the federal government actually uh, subsidizes the building of stadiums in various places as well. Uh, But most subsidies and most uh, 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 funding for stadiums and, and other sort of venues are from state and local sources. I'll, I'll, let me run through some facts about the economics of stadiums because I think it's it's interesting. Yeah, let's uh, do they're, it. They're, first of all, like there are a whole bunch of sports economists. I imagine that it's a c- sort of attractive, you know, uh, place to go if you're an economist uh, because it sounds like a little bit more fun than maybe other areas mm-hmm. of the economy. Uh, so mm-hmm. uh, it, one one source I found 
uh, did a, the, a survey of economists, you know, sort of like a four out of five dentists agree type of thing. 86% of economists agree that local and state governments should eliminate all subsidies and funding for sports franchises because it costs taxpayers more than it provides. Uh, there was a major study done in the late 90s uh, that that uh, ended up uh, in a book uh, length publication. It was a collection of essays or of articles on this. And uh, they found zero sports franchises uh, that resulted in a reasonable return on investment for states. I've cities. heard this kind of statistic before. Yeah. I mean, it is it is widely known and near universally accepted that stadiums are bad investments, right? Like the, uh, But it's just a prestige factor that no mayor can do without or something uh, like they always they always I mean, uh, uh, these things are constantly being ripped down and built again. Yes. And there's there's a good reason for that. Uh, uh, and well, I can talk about that right now. You know, so most people who are sports fans. Uh, and this is another this is another important piece of evidence that I'll, I'll just get out there right now. Uh, Gallup does polling about uh, who uh, describes themselves as sports fans. Uh, uh, Sixty percent of people uh, when surveyed describe themselves as being a fan of sports. Uh, most like the largest sector by far is well off men. Uh, upper income men are the highest percentage, then middle class and then lower income men. Um, and so in any place that you go, right, the, you're going to max out at around like 60, 65 percent of people who are even fans of a particular sports team. Uh, of that 60 percent, how many people actually use the stadium, right? Uh, ha- actually go to live oh, sporting events? Probably less than 10 percent. Yeah, very, very few, right? Um, and in fact, uh, the reason that you pointed out a minute ago that like these stadiums are constantly being renovated uh, and uh, and ripped down and rebuilt. And the reason is uh, that people tend to not go to old stadiums. Uh, there's about a three-year period after building a new stadium where you see the, um, a massive rise in ticket sales. And yeah. that makes a lot of money for the teams. Uh, but it does not make money for cities or states. Um, I see. And so owners are really, really pushing for improvements to stadiums all the time. Uh, because they just get a three-year revenue boost, exactly, basically? Exactly, yeah. And and while huh. it might not be good for the city, uh, owners have some leverage over cities, which is what I want to talk about with Benson, uh, because they can leave, right? Uh, they... Uh, are are constantly threatening to take their business elsewhere, right? And this was like Benson's deal. He was uh, not a well liked owner uh, uh, in New Orleans through much of his career uh, because he was constantly threatening to take the team elsewhere if the city did not meet his demands for stadium uh, for stadium renovations at the uh, Superdome. I see. And so, so that's what I want to talk about uh, uh, today. I, I wanted to like, so why, what are, do you have any, re- can you come up with any reasons why a city might want to build a stadium for a sports team? Well, it is good for your city publicity. People who are traveling to the area will come to sports. So sports tourism. And sports events. Okay. Yeah, sports tourism and tourism generally. Okay. You know, I mean, it enhances your overall status as a city. I mean, there is a difference between cities that have major league or, or professional sports franchises and those that don't. And you kind of, if you're a sports viewer fan, as I am, I think on a certain level, you do sort of rank cities by the teams that they have or if they have teams at yeah. all. Yeah. I mean that's that's you know? a pretty abstract benefit. Like it's not clear how that would translate into into an economic benefit. But the, t- the- I'm not saying it does, but you asked me yeah. what, what I thought. <laughs> well the tourism one is is one of the four four major reasons that uh cities give for when they subsidize sports. And uh I'm taking this from the the sports economist Andrew Zimbalist's work. Uh, and he outlines four reasons why cities subsidize sports or say they Subsidized sports, and one of okay, the, one so of them sports, is tourism. Sports tourism. Right? Another one. Another is, another one is b- like I'm sure selling sports merchandise or enhancing the economy in other ways. Yes, right. Um, new local employment that's going to lead to uh, more economic activity in and around the sports 
franchise. Uh, and and then the, the, uh, the obvious one that we're missing is construction jobs, right? Uh, that when you build yeah. a new thing. Uh, and, and there's a fourth one, the, the multiplier effect that I'll get into last, which is sort of what you were just talking about. Uh, so those are the four pros that cities outline whenever they're advocating for a new stadium. Uh, the, the cons uh, are uh, are that none of those are true, right? None of uh, <laughs> none of those things. The four pros are all just complete fabrications, as far as economists are concerned. Uh, um, okay. Uh, one, you know, the construction jobs is is easy to uh, um, dismantle, right? They're temporary jobs um, that once the stadium is built, uh, and you know, and, and it's questionable, like how many of the construction jobs are actually carried out by local businesses. Uh, th- as far as employment goes, uh, the people working in stadiums are generally working part-time minimum wage jobs. They're not great jobs. Uh, as far as the facilities management goes, and uh, and the revenue from ticket sales, uh, concessions, merchandise, uh, broadcasting, like all of the things that make money, uh, all of that money goes to managers, owners, uh, players, right? Like the, the mm-hmm. m- almost all of the money that's generated from sports goes to a very, very tiny class of people. And the jobs that are created uh, are uh, minuscule uh, in in, right. in relationship to uh, the attention uh, that sports. A lot get. of short term jobs, a lot of low wage yeah. jobs. And so the the funny the funny stat that uh, I, that I found is that uh, a baseball team, like a a, a regular uh, baseball team, uh, if you the sort of average baseball team, has the same economic impact as a mid sized department store or a supermarket. On a city. Whoa. <laughs> so that's that's the the sort of That's crazy. That's a that's that's one of those eye opening. Yeah. Uh here's a, another another stat. If every Chicago sports team disappeared tomorrow, uh it would it would cut a fraction of one percent from sh- Chicago's economy. Uh Whoa. It, it has very what? little impact. Um that's surprising to me. Yeah. Uh it was surprising to me as well. Uh and uh, the the funny thing is, is that it doesn't cost one point six billion dollars to build a supermarket or a mid sized department store. And so when you're tied, the reason that economists hate stadiums is because they look at things in terms of opportunity costs. When you build a stadium, you're not using that money for something else. You're not making, right. you know, uh, museums, roads, bridges schools, parks, right? Like all of the things that you would right. otherwise use the money for, the money is not going there, right? Uh, um, and so if from the economist perspective, you're building a $1.6 billion supermarket, right? Uh, and the only sort of legitimate argument uh, is that the sports team creates a public good that you could not reasonably derive from another source. Right. But as we talked about at the very beginning, that public good is limited uh, because not everyone is equally <laughs> likely to be a sports fan. Right? Like the, that that public good is created for a particular subset of the population. Uh, uh, and the, the last the, the last one I was talking about is the uh, the multiplier effect. Right. And that's the idea. Yeah. That, like the multiplier effect. OK. The city uh, says we're going to make an investment of one hundred million dollars. But that that hundred million dollars is going to operate like an economic stimulus. And we're going to get more than one hundred million dollars of uh, financial increase for the area. Right. So um, uh, uh, you should already be able to guess why that doesn't work. Uh, it's because almost all of the money that's generated from economic activity from a new stadium goes to a tiny number of players, managers, coaches, uh, owners mainly, right? Like, uh, <laughs> and mm-hmm. and not to workers, right? Like, not and not to the city. Uh, and then they make, you know, the the funniest uh, thing is that then they they make this this argument that, oh, actually. Yeah, it's it, that that might be true, right? But the whole surrounding area of bars and restaurants and shopping districts is is going to be stimulated just by people being in the area. Did they debunk that too? Yes, that's that's absolutely not fa- not true. Uh, but the the even funnier thing is that 
in the case of the Superdome and in the case of a lot of other places, the same guy owns all of that stuff, too. Uh, Tom Benson owns uh, like the entire like shopping district around there. And in fact, his wife and this is a this is a really weird connection to what you're doing, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, his wife just bought the largest hotel uh, adjacent to the stadium, uh, which is a, hmm. a Hyatt hotel. Um, oh yeah, there is a there is a connection there, and uh, and so like they just own that stuff, right? Uh, um, and uh, and uh, so here's my here's my question. Yeah. you know, I mean, I think all this is really fascinating. I'm just wondering why cities don't have more leverage to negotiate better deals. You know, it's like there's there's only a certain number of cities. Why do they just all cave and decide that they need? Is it sort of public opinion? Or do people just really love the sports teams yeah. and will be really pissed off if they're is that the whole deal? Uh, people will be very mad if they lose their sports teams. And that will reflect badly on politicians, right? Because the inevitable thing that happens is the owners uh, or, you know, the the marketing and communications people for the sports teams are going to tell everybody that the city was unwilling to negotiate uh, on this deal. No city government or state government wants to be responsible for losing a sports team. Um, and, and there's a lot of pressure on them. Uh, to to retain them, right? And so that's that's part of the leverage that sports teams have uh, over uh, state and local governments. I just wonder if you like put a referendum out there and sort of gave people an honest accounting of how much money they were spending or sacrificing to keep their sports team in their town, whether the support would still be there. That's a great question. And I don't know because I don't get the sense that people uh, really understand just how much tax money goes uh, to sports team owners. Uh, for instance, Benson, uh, I mean, this is, this is just insane to me, right? Like, uh, uh, fact, like, so let's, let's transition a little bit, right? Like that was a, that was a zoomed out sort of, uh, uh, you know, piece of information about the economics of uh, sports venues in general. Let's talk about Benson specifically, right? So like, yeah, what's up with Benson? They, uh, uh, there are so many schemes uh, where, uh, like, just in what are called inducement payments, which are more like just money that uh, the state of Louisiana gives to Tom Benson directly to to induce him to keep his team in Louisiana. Uh, was twenty three and a half million dollars a year? That's, that's really that's, remarkable. That's taxpayer money that is just given to this guy so that he doesn't move his team to San Antonio. <laughs> like so that, that's like one scheme that he had going on. That's there, insane. It is insane. Twenty three million dollars a year. Yes. Uh, now, in two thousand and twelve, they got rid of the inducement payments. Uh, not because they were obscene. Uh, actually, it was. It was because they were a bad PR thing, right? Like he was getting criticized for them. Uh, but they worked out a deal whereby he would actually make more money than the inducement payments from a different scheme that's even worse, right? Like, what's the difference? Um, okay, so I mean, this this sort of gets us into this the the backstory of uh, the relationship between Katrina, the Superdome, and Tom Benson. Um, so who is Tom Benson? Can yeah, you, can you yeah. do any of that, or do you want to do that later? No, no, no. Let's 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 back it up a little bit and talk about Tom Benson. He, uh, like I said, he bought the team in 1985. Uh, famous for constantly threatening to move the team elsewhere if he didn't get what he wanted in terms of stadium renovations. Uh, in 2001. So if you remember, in case you don't remember, uh, Katrina happened in two, August 2005. Uh, in 2001. He had uh, negotiated for $300 million in Superdome upgrades, and uh, he got $187 million in subsidies and concessions uh, from the state uh, in that same deal. Uh, and, th and the reason that the state put that money up is because he was threatening to leave. Um, then Katrina comes and, and uh, as we all know, uh, destroys the Superdome. Not completely destroyed, but it required 
uh, if they were going to use it again, it required it would require. I mean, uh, uh, tons and tons of renovations. I think it added up to four hundred and fifty right. million when they uh, finally got through with it. Um, but Benson, after Katrina, so like, so New Orleans is destroyed and going through uh, uh, one of the worst, you know, uh, sort of natural disasters and and humanitarian tragedies that has ever happened in the United States. And Benson uh, is in his home in San Antonio, and he's like. I'm breaking my lease. Uh, the Superdome is unusable, so I'm not gonna <laughs> not paying for this anymore. Also, I'm not coming back unless you give me a new stadium. And wow. people started freaking out uh, that the city hated him. Uh, they were like abandoned, you know. Like uh, uh, again, I read in one article there were like a, a bunch of abandoned refriger- refrigerators uh, on the streets, and people were painting uh, "Do Not Open Tom Benson" inside, um, like just sort of fantasizing about murdering him and stuffing his body in a refrigerator. <laughs> Good night. Yeah. Uh, so like wow. they they really didn't like him, um, and uh, uh, but um, he uh, he was threatening to take the team to San Antonio, threatening. Uh, to to sell it or you know uh, whatever um if he didn't get a new stadium he finally he caved he, he didn't really cave um but he went with uh superdome renovations instead of a new stadium uh because fema agreed to put up 150 million dollars um and then the nfl was like the superdome is a symbol of new orleans comeback and uh and the the saints belong in the superdome and so the nfl ended up putting up some money as well and so the deal essentially was too good to pass up uh so they renovated the superdome uh, for about four hundred and fifty million dollars, uh, as part of that deal, uh, he was getting these inducement payments. Um, and uh, to jump ahead a little bit, two thousand and nineteen, uh, his wife got another deal with the city of New Orleans to put another four hundred and fifty million dollars into the Superdome for renovations. And wow, uh, it's important to remember that these renovations uh, now after Katrina, they had to be done because of water damage and and, uh, and various other forms of damage. But uh, uh, the, what they're doing now uh, and what they did as part of the Katrina renovations was basically just increase the number of luxury boxes. Right, like that. This is there's it's a, no way any sort of like democratic operation where they want to give more people an opportunity to see games. Right, like what they're trying to do is to to create new revenue streams within the stadium right. uh, to make more money. Uh, so, uh, so what was really fun. So they like, um, after they started getting criticized for these inducement payments that it, he was extorting from the city in the, in the wake of Katrina, you know, just, just taking advantage of taxpayers, right? Like this is taxpayer money. Um, uh, he restructured his contract with the city and so that he wouldn't lose that money, but actually he would make more money. Uh, there was an abandoned office building and an abandoned mall uh, next to the Superdome. And okay. he's like, uh, give me those buildings. Right. And so he he purchased those buildings from the city for a reduced rate. And as part of his contract, the city had to agree to put all of its offices in those buildings at an above market rate. So like they had oh, to you're pay kidding. they had to pay and continue that is a scheme. to pay That's above a market scheme. rents to Tom Benson to the Benson family uh to induce them to not take the saints elsewhere, right? And so like he is a slumlord but for the government of Louisiana. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like it's, uh, uh, you know, wow. Like, yeah. Um so uh, so yeah, I mean, like that's that's how it works, right? Like the that uh, they structure these deals, uh, and they get um, uh, all of this, uh, 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 these tax breaks, these subsidies, this uh, taxpayer funded renovations uh, from cities and states, and uh, all of the profits that come through that stadium uh, stick with. The Benson family, uh, uh, the they sold the you know here's a good one, they sold the naming rights to the stadium to Mercedes Benz and they get fifty million dollars every ten years 
uh, for naming rights, right? The city doesn't get any of that. You're kidding. Parking, merchandise, concessions, tickets, ads, broadcasting rights, uh, all of that stuff. None of that goes back. None to of the, it goes to the city. No, the city gets basically nothing. No, they get a few measly jobs, uh, and they get to say that they've revitalized a district because they just keep building more stuff down there. Like they have all this like new shopping stuff, and uh, <clears throat> that's super sad. It is very sad. Um, uh, I mean, uh, especially right uh, after Katrina, right? Like uh, that. There is a lot of really good stuff that you could spend tax dollars on that is not luxury boxes for wealthy customers in Tom Benson's Superdome, right? Like, I mean, just insane. Um, and what's even funnier, like one, I have one last thing. And and this is, this is one, this is the sort of thing that like really interests me just as an individual, which is that. I, I didn't even know that this industry existed before researching this. But so uh, I guess I, I guess maybe I never thought about it or maybe I just sort of assumed that the responsibility for managing the Superdome because it's pu- you know nominally publicly owned, uh, that that stadiums were that, like the, the cities would just sort of like create those jobs right like that, that there would be somebody who managed security and somebody who um you know did all of the logistics around concessions and and like right. that those would be like city jobs or state jobs but they're not at all uh the superdome since its inception has been managed by a multinational corporation based in philadelphia called smg oh wow and it was smg was recently bought by a private equity company called Aries Capital, uh, then Aries Capital, as as so often happens with private equity, as we've been talking about, sold it to another private equity firm called Onyx Capital, who then merged it with the largest facilities management company called AEG. And so uh, this is just happening this year. Uh, so this there's a a parent company now called ASM Global that is a merger of the two largest facilities management companies uh that basically manage every venue every large venue that there is not just in the United States but in every continent so if i the buy globe. a beer and some nachos at a at a professional sporting event or a, a major concert these people are likely getting a taste. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the way that the facilities management company makes its money is to take fees for doing everything. Right. So even that, even the job, like it, it, the, 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 the economic uh, uh, results of a new stadium is almost entirely limited for the local economy, almost entirely limited to uh, part time minimum wage jobs. Right, Like that. Yeah. They're, you know, the people who do the managing stuff uh, uh, likely live in the area. Right. But like the company that manages them is some sort of private equity owned global conglomerate, you know, that has that no connection. Just, that's pretty shocking. Yeah. Um, and so that the, the industry of facilities management has been con- Consolidated to a, basically a monopoly. I think there, there's one very small competitor to ASM Global. Uh, well, maybe we'll draw the ASM Global guys before too long. Yeah, Who maybe. Um, although uh, they don't even have a website yet. This is a very brand new merger. Um, and uh, uh, so we'll see what happens with that. But um, yeah, you know, so, you know, that's it. Um, uh, Tom Benson is, uh, you know, he's he's a guy who just extorted a crippled city uh, for every penny that he could get out of them. Uh, and um, and uh, then he died. He's dead now. So... So let me just say, this is the last time I'm going to let you assign me 11 billionaires. Because <laughs> that was a little unfair. I will. It's uh, not even close and, and to fair. To, you know, like to, in my defense, it wasn't me. It was the random selector machine that did it. So, <laughs> it's true. Um, but I didn't really fully grasp what I was signing on for. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was so, you know, what we're going to deal with today uh is, is 
this Pritzker family, but my research and my coverage of it is going to be pretty scattershot. We drew Jennifer Pritzker. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer Pritzker came off the roulette wheel. So uh, what what is there to know about Jennifer Pritzker? She is one of 11 billionaires in the Pritzker family. She is the world's only known transgender billionaire. Huh. And is also the only Pritzker in the of these 11 billionaire Pritzkers to have served in the military. Hmm. So recently she wrote an opinion article in the Chicago Tribune titled, I'm a transgender Republican, but my party is marginalizing me out of existence. Yeah, no shit. Uh, which seems like a... Uh, interesting voice to hear in this particular moment. <laughs> this is what always like confused. Like, why? What is you know? I mean, it's not like a shocker, but like you know, um, Jesus. Why be? Why be a Republican if you're right? Is that what you're getting? Yeah. At? yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I just don't understand how people can sort of equate their economic interests. Maybe, maybe that's what being rich means. Maybe that's why I'm not rich. Right. Like, is, is, is like I, you know, I have a life and death situation on the one hand, and then I have my tax returns on the other hand. It's like, <laughs> these are not equitable concerns to me. Right. Like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. So what I'm going to do here is introduce you to the Pritzker family. And then talk about some of them. I don't even think I'm going to touch on all 11, but I'll try to touch on as many of them as I can and highlight some interesting things about them and sort of give you some sense of the the dominant powerhouse wealthy family that uh, the Pritzkers have been for the last 50, 100 years. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm going to start with a quote that I'm pulling from uh, another Chicago Tribune article. These, it's a Chicago family, so there's a lot of like articles in Chicago about them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so here's the quote. When it comes to private families, they don't come much more private than the Pritzkers. Members of Chicago's wealthy Pritzker clan hold their vast $15 billion empire in trust funds, many of them overseas, they employ lawyers who fight to keep family legal matters inside sealed courtrooms away from the public, and they shun almost all requests for interviews. So, you know, this characterization is consistent with, like, the Bechtels that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And who, who were you talking about last time? A couple of episodes ago. Just another one of these families that has sort of learned to hide from the press right. in some ways. Yeah. Certain people obviously engage with the, the, the certain Pritzkers obviously engage with the press a lot more than other Pritzkers. And I'll kind of talk about that. But I thought that quote was interesting because, it, it, you know, again, it sort of reinforces an observation we've already made on the show. A little bit of family history. Yeah. Where'd they get their money? The Pritzker empire begins with Nicholas Pritzker, who uh, immigrated from Kiev and worked as a pharmacist and lawyer uh, in the early 20th century. His son, Abram, got a Harvard law degree, practiced in his dad's firm for a while, and then uh, in, in the, in the mid 1930s moved into the real estate business in Chicago. And I think this was sort of the, mm. this beginning of, um, the empire. Yeah. So, okay. This family is most well known probably for owning the Hyatt hotel chain. And, Abram's sons purchased the Hyatt House Hotel in L.A. in the late 1950s and began building the, the chain thereafter. Part of their business strategy was, I guess, kind of forward thinking in that they were one of the first hotel chains to think about how important it might be to have accommodations near airports. Oh, yeah. So they started building their, their hotels next to airports and were sort of off and, and running from there. A few years before launching Hyatt, a couple of the sons formed the Marmon Group. The Marmon Group is a diversified holding company which owns and produces transportation equipment and electrical parts, 
Uh, also, at one point, included transunion credit reporting and interests in water filtration systems. I think the thing that that becomes sort of amazing when you look into the Pritzker family holdings over the course of decades is that they have their their mitts and everything. Yeah. I mean, so it's the, not just the, the reaches of of what their business enterprise uh, involves is is like, I mean, Jay Pritzker, uh, who is a Pritzker who sort of took the helm of things in the mid 20th century and and built the business for several decades, bought and sold over 200 companies in his career. And so, I mean, it's impossible huh. to track how much stuff they the family has has owned at at one point or another. So Hyatt's just um, sort of like their biggest asset. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's not, not even close. Okay. To, yeah, I mean, and it's, they've splintered off in so many directions, and the, the, so, so many of their companies have subsidiaries, and they're just, you know, they're invested in everything. I mean, it, it it's noteworthy, uh, given your segment today that, and I could be wrong about this. I'm not 100% that I researched this into the ground, but as far as I know, none of these 11 billionaire Pritzkers own a professional sporting team. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't think that they ever have. Um, If people want to fact check us on that and prove us wrong, we'd be happy to uh, make that correction. Uh, so what I've, what I've kind of planned in a, in an effort to introduce us to some different parts of the Pritzker clan uh, is I've introduced a new sub segment that will only be occurring on the show one time today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this sub segment is titled five reasonably likely outcomes. If you happen to be the scion of billionaires. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> uh, and so the first one of these reasonably likely outcomes is that at some point during your life, you'll find yourself related to a sitting governor. I think that that's proven yeah. true in at least a couple of examples so far. Yeah. Who, who Haslam? Haslam was a governor or what, what uh, was that? No, yeah. No, Haslam was a too. Uh, Haslam's brother is a governor. Uh, Simplot's yeah. sister's husband was the governor of Idaho. Um, right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, that that's such a weird coincidence how <laughs> these billionaires keep yeah, end up totally being random. related to governors. <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so do you know, uh, which Pritzker is governor of governor of what state? Do you have any concept Ooh, of this? No, I don't. Uh, let me guess. Um, let's see. We got hotels. We got a bunch of like some energy stuff you said, or water purification. I mean, that's just, uh, I mean, that's like I'm a weird with, thing to even. I'm going to go with uh, Arizona. It's not bad. Illinois. Yeah. Well, I didn't. Okay. I, I purposefully did not guess Illinois because they're from Chicago. So, uh, uh, I assumed that you weren't asking me uh, to come up with the most obvious. Well, you were wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah that was very tricky of you. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't trying to be. I forgot I told you that they were from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in any event, J.B. Pritzker is the governor of Illinois right now. And he's doing a lot of different things, including there's a big bill right now that uh, he's supposed to sign legalizing marijuana and he's getting a lot of press for like moving legislation in all these different ways. Um, But before he was elected, there was a long period of him trying to like insinuate himself into Chicago and Illinois politics Mm -hmm. in different ways. In his governor's race against the former Illinois governor, Bruce Rauner, there got to be some nasty negative advertising. And at one point, uh, at a certain point during the campaign, 
Rahner took out a 14 minute long TV commercial <laughs> that aired an 11 minute FBI wiretap conversation <gasps> between J.B. Pritzker and Rod Blagojevich, nice. the former governor. I feel like, of I, Illinois. I, feel so, like I remember hearing about this. Uh, do you, what do you remember about Rod Blagojevich? Oh, I definitely remember Rod Blagojevich. Uh, he's the one, uh, oh, what was the famous line? Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just give away this fucking golden egg or something, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, he was the one who tried to sell Obama's, uh, Senate seat, uh, after right. I mean, he, he became president. Yeah. He was a serious pay to play yeah. kind of mover and shaker who he's kind of the poster boy um, got, got for for state level political corruption in the United States. Right. right. Like if you say yeah. name a corrupt politician, a lot of people in the Midwest, you know, or at least in Illinois, are gonna be like, oh, Rod Blagojevich, right? <laughs> right. I think he was yeah, on I mean, dancing definitely... with the stars, though, uh after oh, he got yeah, out of prison. Or, or the apprentice or something. Yeah. I think he was on the apprentice. Yeah. He, I mean, he's a cartoon character. Yeah. I mean, you know, like his hair, everything about him. I mean, he's a sort of yeah. absurd human being. Even his and name. You hear him on these, blah, 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 blah. And you, you hear him on the wiretaps and it just sort of reinforces all of the assumptions that you were going to make about him based on what you'd heard in the news. So I, I listened to this uh, 14 minute long TV commercial. I watched it. <laughs> <laughs> the things we go um, through for this show. I know. It was actually pretty interesting. I mean, obviously it didn't work because J.B. Pritzker is governor and Bruce Rauner's not. Um, but the things that were said in the recordings sort of give you a flavor of what these kinds of high level political exchanges are probably what what's typical of these sort of insider conversations you know you have jb pritzker sort of lobbying um for a position as treasurer and blagojevich is sort of dangling different sorts of possibilities different sorts of favors that could possibly mm -hmm. be done everything is sort of in semi veiled kind of like not super close to the chest, but not super overt until Blagojevich comes out and asks J.B. Pritzker for money. <laughs> <laughs> and J.B. Pritzker just cut to the like, chase. <laughs> you know, it's not quite like that. It's not quite that transactional, but they're talking about a bunch of different things. And he's like, you know, and if you could, you know, like give me. Uh, you know, help me out in the way that you helped out this other politician. <laughs> that would be really great. And J.B. Britzker was like, I really don't think that we should be talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it ultimately, like, I mean, obviously the whole kind of system is corrupt and these kinds of, kinds of conversations sort of illustrate that corruption. But I didn't think that the tape made Pritzker look all that bad. It just sort of like, again, reinforces what we sort of already know, but didn't reveal anything like more egregious than usual. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, the thing about that is like <clears throat> uh, nobody but a weirdo like you is going to bother listening to it or even watching it on TV when the guy broadcasts it. It's just about the news story. Like, oh, a conversation with Rod Blagojevich that he uh, paid to have 14 minutes of played live on television. This must be bad, maybe. You know? I mean, I bet I bet a fair number of people saw it on TV. It's got a couple hundred thousand hits on on YouTube, but I bet a lot of people saw it. You know, I mean, if you're already a a Republican and a big Ronner supporter, then maybe it sort of it cemented feelings that you already had but for anybody on the fence I, it's it's hard to imagine that it did a lot right. to to move the needle moving on to number 2 uh our second reasonably likely outcome if you happen to be the scion of a billionaire some branch of your family will have at some point benefited from a nine figure tax break <laughs> Seems reasonably likely uh, if you happen to have been born into this kind of wealth. Um, the the example from the Pritzker family that I'm using to illustrate this point is Penny Pritzker, who uh, has a particularly interesting story. 
the Pritzker family purchased uh, this bank in the late 1980s. It was a, a flailing bank. Um, and under Penny's leadership, they began carrying out an aggressive growth strategy focused on <clears throat> subprime home mortgages and car loans. Now, oh, cool. when they purchased the bank, they this is when they got like an insane tax break to sort of grease the wheels mm -hmm. of this transaction. They immediately started to engage in all of this super shady financial behavior. And within a few years, their subprime holdings drew the attention of banking regulators. Um, th the bank, Superior Bank, failed in 2001 and wound up having to pay $460 million to the U.S. government to offset bank insurance claims. As it turns out, they still left 1,400 depositors hanging out to dry to the tune of about $15 million mm. because the money that these depositors left in their accounts <clears throat> exceeded the federally insured limit. So, you know, yeah. like shady on multiple levels. Penny Pritzker goes on to become Obama's Secretary of Commerce from 2013 to 2017. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm not sure why Obama thought that was a good idea. Well, I mean, the Obama legacy vis-a-vis -vis banks and bankers is not good. Right? I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, that, I mean, I didn't I didn't uh, know that uh, his secretary of commerce. I mean, I probably should have I'm just like a politically illiterate American. Uh, I didn't know that his secretary of commerce was uh heavily invested in uh, subprime mortgages. Um, that's uh, I mean, she probably had a lot of time to do PR work between 2001 when th the real embarrassment happened. Right. And the time she was yeah. brought on, it was over a decade later. Who knows? She might have done a bunch of good things. I'm Because I had 11 billionaires, I didn't have a chance to <laughs> research them all <laughs> in detail. So my third reasonably likely outcome, if you happen to be the scion of billionaires. One or more of your family members will at some point file a lawsuit against <laughs> one or more other family members. Yeah. I didn't get a, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but um, there is a lot of funny stuff uh, about Tom Benson right before he died. Uh, he uh, cut a bunch of his kids out of his will. Uh, his <laughs> wife and his kids were fighting. Uh, in the, the lawsuit, the ki the kids claimed that uh, he was living on candy and soda uh, because people weren't giving him real food or something. It's crazy. Uh, just crazy drama. <laughs> yeah. So there's similar drama with the Pritzker family. The, the main lawsuit that's gotten a lot of publicity uh, was a lawsuit filed uh by Liesel Pritzker Simmons, who sued her dad and cousins, <laughs> claiming that they looted trust funds for her and her brother. Um, and basically, the suit alleged that in the aftermath of Jay Pritzker's death, there was a secret pact to divide the fortune among all the family members that excluded her and her brother, Matthew. So they settled, and I think that uh, Liesel and, and Matthew each got $500 million or something, and then were cut off from that point on. You know, Liesel <clears throat> starred in Air Force One with Harrison Ford when she was <laughs> younger. Really? Like, oh. she's already young, but I guess as a sort of child actor. So um, are you ready for number four? I'm ready. Four is the most basic and the most boring, reasonably likely outcome if you happen to be the scion of a billionaire. All right. Someone in your family will wind up operating a venture capital fund. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> That's what Karen Pritzker did. This is Jennifer's sister, who happens mm -hmm. to be the richest individual Pritzker. Oh. Uh, she launched, she <clears throat> launched Launch Capital, LLC. Any big... Uh... Ventures that paid off? No, I didn't even really research it more than that because I was too bored. <laughs> just, <laughs> just venture capital, yeah. 
Super rich. Yeah. Ven- okay. Venture capital sounds like it's interesting and fun, but most of like almost all of it is incredibly boring. It's like, uh, you know, um, uh, like uh, Robert F. Smith that we talked about last week. It's like, yeah, he's a venture capital guy, but um, it's all like enterprise software. Right? <laughs> you know, like it's yeah. just the, the, you know. Uh, I don't have any attention for that. Yeah. So the fifth reasonably likely outcome, if you happen to be the scion of a billionaire, someone in your family will wind up working in the entertainment industry. So I already mentioned that Liesl Pritzker Simmons was in Air Force One and some other things. Gigi Pritzker is a Hollywood film producer. Her production company, Odd Lot Entertainment, operates out of Culver City. She produced Drive, starring Ryan Gosling. Mm. You've seen Drive? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was critically acclaimed. (laughs) good movie i like drive yeah it's good good Uh, soundtrack she also produced uh mordecai starring johnny depp that i didn't see uh that looked really bad i didn't see it and it was not critically acclaimed it didn't do well i think if i was a billionaire i think like uh like film producer for like really bad movies would i would do like uh slasher films or something like the like uh uh, the guys from The Sopranos, like Little Carmine from The Sopranos. Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Chad, if you were going to be a Pritzker, I think of all the Pritzkers, you would be Daniel Pritzker, who I read somewhere is the most openly eccentric Pritzker. <laughs> but after receiving his JD from Northwestern, he went on to form the band Sonia Dada, whose song. You Don't Treat Me No Good peaked at number one on the Australian top singles chart in right. 1992. Uh, he, he, we should link to some of these music videos of yeah. Sonia Dada because they're kind of funny. Um, and uh, did he, li- like, why Australia? Did he, li- was he living in Chicago or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the band's a Chicago band. It just got hot in New Zealand and Australia. Yeah. Not as hot here, hmm. but that was his claim to fame. Another one of his claims to fame is that in 2002, he purchased Jerry Garcia's Wolf guitar for seven hundred ninety thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, cool. you know, that's some of the Pritzkers. That's all I had time to do. I hope that was fun and interesting in certain ways. I don't think that there's any big takeaways except that, you know, if you're born rich, you can do a bunch of different stuff. Okay. So that was fun. Good job today, Chad. Good job to you too. Uh, Lots of interesting stuff on the Pritzkers. So we are... About to open up the random selector. Uh, Let's see who we get. I want just one this time. That's what I'm hoping yeah, for. Yeah, I, I, I'll make sure that uh, that you only get one. Number one is George Bishop. Geo Southern Energy owner and CEO. Uh, he sold Southern Energy to Devon Energy for $6 billion. Uh, and his net worth is around $2.4 billion. What's his name? George Bishop. Okay. All right. That moving, sounds pretty bland, but we'll moving see. on to number two. Tom and oh my god, I can't believe this happened. Um, we got another truck stop owner, uh, oh. Tom and Judy Love. I didn't oh, know the loves. I oh, did. I loves. mean, I, I'm familiar with Love's truck stops, but I just assumed it was named after the emotion, not <laughs> a person. <laughs> Uh, loves um, travel stops and country stores. Well, um, it seems like I've got to do the love since you already did truck stops, right? That's true. Yeah. So I will God. do, uh, I'll do George Bishop. Does that seem rather unlikely that like we've gotten two trucks, st- like we would have gotten like diamonds or something by now before another truck well, stop, really? Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, how many out of all, out of all 540 or so billionaires, how many are, uh, truck stop owners? There can't be too many more. 
Um, uh, but like, I guess, you know, it's profitable stuff. Um, all right. So I'm doing the loves as it turns out, you gave me two, but that's fine. <laughs> I did give you two. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so episode nine is going to be an energy episode. Yeah. Uh, we have, a uh, uh, geo Southern, uh, which I'm guessing is oil and we have, uh, loves truck stops. So we got the right. we got the people who get it out of the ground, and then we got the people who sell it. Well, there should be some continuity there. That'll be good. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. As always, thank you guys for listening. If you could take the time to like and subscribe, that would be helpful. We're always trying to increase our publicity out there in the potosphere. Chad, any final words? Uh, follow us on Twitter and uh, like the – there's a page on Facebook. Um that you could also like. I don't really know what that does, but uh, I, I, you know, I send out tweets from time to time, so um, you can you can keep in touch with us there. Awesome, follow Chad. He 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 does funny things. Thanks again for listening. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>